Every corny YouTube video requires a scene of the YouTuber dramatically waking up from a nightmare, like so. And to make that become a reality, I partnered with Manta Sleep to be the sponsor of today's video. Getting good night's sleep and feeling rested after doing so are very important. Manta Sleep offers customers top quality sleep masks to aid in viewers like you doing just that. The one they sent me was called the Manta Sleep Sound, which solved an age-old problem for me. Everyone likes to listen to music or to podcasts or whatever when they're trying to get to sleep, but listening to the phone speakers sucks, and also having bulky headphones on or earbuds on while trying to sleep certainly is not ideal. The Manta Sleep Sound Mask is a Bluetooth device that you can easily pair with your phone or whatever device you want, and you can listen to music with it while napping or trying to sleep. It's perfect, as Murray would say in Sly 2. But Manta has a whole host of different masks available on their website, like the Manta Cool Mask or the Manta Steam Mask, designed for people with different sleeping needs that you can easily identify with their sleep quiz and their website. To get in on this action, and believe me, we know you want to, you're going to want to head to their website and use my code Jay's Reviews to get 10% off on your order. Thanks again to Manta Sleep for sponsoring this video. Now, the only YouTube cliche I really need is a demonic force appearing out of nowhere and demanding I review a crappy game for fear of losing my soul or something like that. But while the visual effects team works on that, I suppose I can just start the regularly scheduled game review. One of gaming's biggest blockbusters from the last decade would undoubtedly be the Batman Arkham franchise, which consists of four main core installments and a couple of spin-offs. Still heralded to this day as genre-defining experiences in the action and open-world spheres, captivating players both casual and hardcore with a massive focus on narrative and mechanics that are easy to pick up and play, but also fun to master with a focus on one of pop culture's longest-running and most famous superheroes, Batman. I've been doing the YouTube shtick for almost eight years, and despite that, I've never covered a single entry in the Batman Arkham series. I couldn't even tell you why. It's a matter of my having never gotten around to it before, despite it being a glaring omission from my roster of videos. Since I'm obviously obviously a massive fan of it. The Arkham series has been a huge request from my audience for several years at this point, mainly stemming from the fact that in 2017 through 2020 I did what I called the DC Animated Universe Retrospective, where I covered a series of DC cartoons that were connected in a shared universe. The first show in it, Batman the Animated Series, debuted Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill as Batman and Joker, and the Arkham games brought them back, so the connection was obvious. But as I said, I just never got around to it until now. So let us fix that by doing a complete Batman Arkham series retrospective over the following several videos. Starting with Batman Arkham Asylum released on the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC in 2009. With everything I discussed in this video, I wanted to explain what exactly it was about Batman Arkham Asylum that grabbed the mainstream audience so much. It certainly wasn't because this was the first Batman game. Batman video games have existed for as long as there have been video games. Some are good and have cult classic status, like Batman on NES or Batman Returns and the Adventures of Batman and Robin on Super Nintendo. Other Batman games are infamous for their abysmal quality, like Batman and Robin on PlayStation or Batman Dark Tomorrow on GameCube. One day I hope to do some kind of a ranking on all the Batman games, but that's neither here nor there. You get the idea though, Batman games are nothing new, and were nothing new when Arkham Asylum was released. Superhero games generally were a dime a dozen since the dawn of gaming, but very few had been considered good. And the good ones, usually based on Batman and Spider-Man, often didn't close the gap between being a solid game and being an all-time classic. This was the thing that made Arkham Asylum so different. It was a blockbuster game with top quality production values and compelling gameplay that stood out from the competition instead of being a clone of some other game. It was a AAA superhero game that promised to make the player feel like Batman, and it succeeded at that. Developed by an unproven team, no less. Rocksteady Studios had only one game, Urban Chaos, on PS2 under their belt, which launched to average scores in 2006. But they got to work on Batman because their publisher, Eidos Interactive, got the Batman game license and saw Rocksteady's prototype and were like, have at it, you're making the next Batman game. And that was an exact quote, by the way. I was there, you can trust me. I have a ton of nostalgia for this game. When this game came out, I just started the third grade. Probably made a significant amount of people watching this feel incredibly old, but bear with me. I had no idea of this game before it came out because I didn't know to look for it. One day, I was just hanging out in the computer back in 2009 and was on Amazon and just typed Batman games into the search bar because I was in a heavy Batman phase at the time. But the top result was Batman Arkham Asylum on Xbox 360 and to say my mind was blown is an understatement. The game just didn't look real. I couldn't even quantify games looking this good from a couple of screenshots and videos. The Amazon page also included these preview videos that I just kept watching over and over. Yeah. 
One of them was a commentary on the stealth gameplay from the game director, Sefton Hill. He was playing the medical building stealth mission from challenge mode, and it just looked so fucking cool. Today I'll be demoing one of the challenge mode maps to give you just a small taster of the Invisible Predator gameplay in Batman. Let's start with looking at what is Predator gameplay. Deep inside Arkham Asylum, Batman is faced with insurmountable odds. The place is full of Joker's henchmen chipped in from Blackgate, and they're armed and ready for him. And as we all know, Batman is not superhuman. They know you're coming, but they don't know where or how. So Predator gameplay is all about using Batman's advantages, his intelligence, his agility, his gadgets, and his ability to plan and prepare before striking. I don't know if I can capture what it was like seeing this gameplay for the first time as a Batman fan when we all live in a world where this game is almost 15 years old and everyone has seen it copied by so many other games and seen its sequels outdo its mechanics over and over. I guess it's a you had to be there sort of thing. But regardless, I knew from moment one that I had to play this freaking game. But there was one obstacle in my way. The T rating and I was like 8 years old going on 9. I had played rated T games before like Jack 2 and 3 or Ratchet and Clank but something about the gritty Batman game just seemed like a harder sell than cartoony games with cartoony weapons that featured some harsh language or suggestive humor or whatever. So my master plan was that I took a piece of paper and wrote down how many years were left between now and my being able to play the game, and taped it on my wall. This lasted a whole day before I decided to just ask for the game anyway, and what do you know, Batman Arkham Asylum on Xbox 360 was then placed in my possession, alongside Jack and Daxter The Lost Frontier, which I was also quite excited for, but we don't like to talk about that. It took me forever to finish this game because I sucked ass at it, but you better believe I was enjoying every second of it. It was even cooler to play than it was to watch. Today, 14 years later, Arkham Asylum is a game I've played maybe a dozen times, but I actually haven't touched it in over six years. Like I said at the beginning, I just got busy doing other stuff with YouTube and all that, and I haven't gone back to these games in a long time. So for that reason, I was pretty excited to get back into Arkham Asylum and show with this video how the game changed the gaming landscape and give my thoughts on how the game holds up when playing it today. Arkham Asylum doesn't take place in any pre-existing Batman continuity, instead told a fresh story where Batman was arriving at Arkham with the Joker after an attack on City Hall. But Batman thinks Joker surrendered too easily and that this is some kind of a setup, and decides to follow the Joker's transfer to intensive treatment where he does indeed break out and begins his massive operation to take over Arkham Asylum with his army of goons that got shipped in from Blackgate Prison after it was mysteriously set on fire. Now it's up to Batman to navigate Arkham Island against a host of goons and supervillains to stop the Joker from taking over the island and then the city at large. Which is a pretty simplistic premise at the end of the day. But Arkham Asylum is a story where less is more. The basic plot is pretty easy to get to grips with if you know anything about Batman, and from there you can be pulled into the various mysteries and twists the plot has to offer. But in my retrospectives, I like to just give the basic outline for some context and then dive into the gameplay, saving the more in-depth story discussion for later. With that said, Arkham Asylum has three core pillars of gameplay. Combat, stealth, and navigation slash exploration. Combat is the one players are introduced to immediately upon Joker's escape, so I can start there. By 2009, 3D combat action was a relatively figured out science. Action games either shot for Devil May Cry's more complicated system of different weapons and strats that fuse together for a stylish system of combat where you play both in the air and on the ground. Or they'd shoot for God of War's more visceral approach with a mix of light attack and heavy attack combos. But Arkham Asylum did something new that can be best described as free flow combat. Square is the only attack button in the game as Batman will punch and kick his foes. You don't control which of these moves he does. There's no specific kick command. But instead, Batman's attacks are context sensitive. You'll start by punching near by enemies, and then the higher your hit combo goes up, it increases the range of Batman's attacks. And by that, I mean you'll think Batman has superpowers as he can fly across the screen, tearing goons to pieces. You can jump over enemies with a double tap of the X button, and you can stun enemies with your cape using circle. And then when an enemy's about to attack you, there'll be a blue indicator over their head, and you press triangle to counterattack. And that's pretty much every major function of Arkham Asylum combat, and it's only on four buttons. One function per button. Attack, counterattack, stun, and evade. A logical fallacy I see people fall into from time to time is the belief that a combat system's quality is directly linked to how complex the systems are. There's often a correlation, but complexity is not required for a satisfactory combat system whatsoever. Arkham Asylum is very simple to play, especially in combat, but it's a lot of fun because it's visceral. The game designers expertly mixed great animation, stellar sound design, and simple mechanics to deliver a satisfying combat system. Every punch in this game feels like it packs a wallop, and that alone is satisfying in and of itself. You bought a Batman game and you're up against an army of Joker goons. 
you want to be able to feel like you can engage a room of enemies like it's nothing because Batman can do that. In making the player feel like Batman, you give them a power trip like no other action game has ever done before. Forcing the player to learn the mechanics to be as competent as the character is supposed to be, like Devil May Cry, is a valid approach, but for Batman, I really wouldn't have had it any other way. The example I always use in this conversation is that Devil May Cry 2 is a bunch of moves and tech you could implement, but the game is bad because it's clunky, slow, and broken, and not even that fun to play if you use its various strats. But Arkham Asylum gets a lot of mileage out of that simplicity for the aforementioned reason of it being fun to be Batman and kick ass. But then, for other reasons that are also intrinsic elements of the game design, like earning more XP for defeating defeating enemies with a high hit combo total which gradually allows you to get more moves. Don't know what half of these expressions on the upgrade screen are supposed to be though, like the health bar expansion. What is that face? Like, is Batman gonna be okay? But the upgrades do give you some other combat options, such as Batarangs instantly sending guys to the ground mid-combo, or timing your punches to be worth two combo points instead of one, or the combo finishers. One of them giving Batman the ability to slowly pick up a guy and toss him at the other enemies, and the other is an instant takedown where Batman breaks the goon's bones in an uber satisfying fashion. Revisiting this game after I played the sequels for god knows how many hours is always weird, since things like combo finishers are in the first game, but there's only one true finisher and it plays out in slow motion and you can't make the slow motion stop. Just weird first game oddities like that are in Asylum. And then there are some issues to how the combat handles. Sometimes Batman can fly towards enemies that are downed and hit them as though they're still standing up and sometimes he can't. Most of the time he can fly across the room to enemies that are far away and sometimes he can't. Or maybe you'll get caught on some object in the way of things that kills your combo and that's annoying because it never feels like it's your fault. Challenge mode maps focused on combat can occasionally be irksome for that reason, but that doesn't detract from the fun spectacle that lasts the whole game. I've already mentioned how satisfying it is to play and to listen to, but just looking at the combat in this game is a sight to behold because there are so many different attack animations and counters especially. Batman has counter animations from guys coming from behind, in front, to the side, with all kinds of different weapons. I imagine getting these combat animations right was something that took quite a lot of time and development and it really pays off. All in all, it's a combat system that was great fun for a first attempt that did have some issues, but the kind you could tell a really good sequel could expand on. But that's only the first major pillar of the game. The second is stealth mechanics. Numerous moments will see Batman having to silently pick his foes off one at a time, and that's the part that they really nailed first try. Tackling a bunch of enemies at once is something you can get in other games, but nothing makes you feel more like Batman than hiding in the shadows above your enemies waiting to get the drop on them. I mean, we've all watched the movies where Batman can just disappear and drop in at a moment's notice, or watch scenes like the one in Batman Begins where Batman makes a sound on one side of the room and then the other side of the room right afterwards, but actually playing that is a lot of fun. Grappling from gargoyles that hang from the walls, you survey your enemies and can lure them around with sound, grab them from above when they're right underneath you, and then take them out using gadgets like the explosive gel, and then hide away in vents to sneak around the other enemies. There are a lot of different pathways to take and opportunities for different gadgets that give each map replayability and variety. At the start of each stealth encounter, the guards are at their most confident, but with each one you pick off, they gradually get more scared until it's down to the last guy who is absolutely terrified and is set off by the most minor sounds. In stealth games, there have been a bunch of different methods designers have given players to help survey areas from radars to sound cues and what have you. In Arkham Asylum, Batman has a detective mode where the cowl augments his vision to display enemy locations. This seems to be a popular choice in designing stealth mechanics with a 3D camera these days because it's simple and effective in allowing players to quickly get their bearings. With all these advantages at your disposal, that makes it seem easy, and I guess it is. Stealth and combat are pretty simple game mechanics in Arkham Asylum, but I feel like it's balanced. First, in the interest of making players feel like Batman, like I said, but also I don't think it's brain dead either. Bullets hurt in this game. You won't last long against them, even with a fully maxed out health bar, which means you gotta stick to the shadows as much as humanly possible. The maps do introduce new elements to increase the challenge as the game goes along, like explosive gargoyles, or enemies being equipped with collars that alert other enemies to when somebody's been taken down. But it's still pretty simple at the end of the day. With both stealth and combat, the game gets a lot of replay value from challenge mode, where you play the various combat and stealth maps from the campaign. You can do this to screw around and have fun, but this is also where you can get more variety out of the simple mechanics. 
In combat, you have to reach really high scores by the end, which requires a mastery of the timing and enemy patterns. For the stealth maps, each challenge mode map will have three objectives you have to complete using your various gadgets, like knocking three guys out with three different explosive gels at the same time. You have to get more creative with your process, which solved my issue from the campaign where I felt like it was pretty easy to just spam a lot of the same tactics, like the inverted takedown over and over again. But I still just wish Batman had more options in stealth when I replay this game. I think this issue stems from how much playtime I've gotten from the sequels rather than inherent issues with Asylum. But for example, I was really surprised there was no great takedown in this game. There was even a challenge mode objective where you had to pop out from a grate and then take down an enemy, when condensing that into one action would have been smoother. He also opens these vents really slowly, which kills the pace of the game mid-stealth. But that sums up pretty much all the issues with Asylum, just little fixes that could make the experience smoother. Such as how Batman's arsenal of gadgets aren't that useful in combat, because they're often slow and only really designed for stealth and exploration. Something a great sequel could improve on. But at least the gadgets are great in their intended functions. Exploration is the third and final pillar of Arkham Asylum, and this is one of the ways Asylum is unique from other games in the series. In most Batman continuities, Arkham is a single building, but it was expanded in the game to be a whole island with different buildings so the game could have more variety. Later Arkham games went full open world sandbox, and while Asylum is open-ended, the progression is more like a Metroidvania where Arkham Island is a central hub and you travel to different areas that are like open-ended levels. Not surprising since the dev team cited Zelda and Metroid as inspirations for the design of Asylum. Batman walked into the Asylum with nothing but Batarangs on hand, but as you get more equipment this allows you to explore the facility in more depth. Weak walls destructible with explosive gel, vents on the wall can be torn down with the bat claw, electric gates can be bypassed with the cryptographic sequencer, the line launcher lets Batman get to places he couldn't before and with more speed, and so on and so on. It's a simple and ancient design philosophy, but it's timeless in that it will always be satisfying in playing a game like this, seeing something you currently can't engage with, and then finding slash realizing what it takes to get in going back, and then doing it. Fully completing Arkham Asylum is going to require a post-game cleanup where you run through old areas with all the stuff unlocked, but it's pretty easy to do and doesn't take much time if you collected as many things as possible on the way. All the side content relates to the Riddler, who hacks into Batman's communications and issues him challenges to solve across the whole island, from lining up question marks to solving riddles and collecting hidden Riddler trophies. I gotta say, the Arkham series really struck gold with the Riddler. This might be my favorite version of the Riddler ever, as he's just the most obnoxious and arrogant loser around. Him being so annoying and having some cocky shit to say whenever you solve an early game riddle just makes you want to keep solving them, as he gradually gets more and more rattled the closer you get to solving them all, leading to his ultimate takedown when you complete all the Riddler content. What? You did it? You must have cheated. There is no way you could have beaten me. Well, you asked for it, Batman. My final challenge for the whole of Gotham is just seconds away. What? The police? You cheated, Batman. You couldn't have outsmarted me. Police, open up! Tell me, how did you work out where I was? Do you hear me? I, Edward Nigma, well... Oh. Some of the things you find give you a better understanding of Arkham and the people in it. Riddles usually relate to a character in the Batman mythos, and then you get a bio on that character. Here you see dozens of characters that are not in the game, like the Penguin, or Firefly, or Killer Moth, or Black Mask. As a kid, I thought it was really interesting to read about characters I had heard of and had never heard of seeing when they debuted in Batman comics, and seeing what history this Batman had with them. These bios reveal that some of the most famous Batman stories like Nightfall or The Killing Joke have somewhat taken place in this universe, but not exactly, because this is its own original universe. It just made the world of Arkham Asylum feel large by leaving a lot of the backstory up to the imagination. Something that's not really there anymore since so many of these Batman rogues would later appear in the sequels, but it's something I enjoyed about Arkham Asylum way back when. For some of the villains that do appear in the game, you can find these Arkham interview tapes between the Doctors and the villains. These were all pretty compelling, but as a seasoned Batman fan, I thought the Harley Quinn tapes being a retelling of her backstory from Batman the Animated Series was great. Especially in Tape 4, where Joker is manipulating Harley to join his side, but throws in this rant about Batman that almost seems like he's being genuine. He's crazy, you know. Who? Batman? No, Santa Claus. Of course, Batman! Always Batman! I've seen it in his eyes. Screaming, mad, stalkers, and dishonest! Hiding his face behind a fright mask. Well, no masks for me! I have nothing to hide! I laugh at the cruel absurdity of the world! But Batman, Batman, he's got them all fooled. He's made them think he can make a difference, that he can actually make things better. And the joke of it is, they all believe it! The police? The police. 
the media, the frickin' Junior Rangers, every last sack of walking meat in this urban cesspool. Listen, sweets, Batman knows we're all on the same funhouse slide in the madness. Why won't he admit it? He's up there in his belfry laughing at us. And the real gag is, the miserable liar is allowed to run free while I'm in here. Gotta love that about Joker as a villain. That might be how he feels about Batman, or it might not. Either way, he's using that as a tool to get Harley to join him. Joker is a compelling villain to listen to for reasons like that. I also thought the Chronicles of Amadeus Arkham were compelling to find and listen to as well. These logs from the founder of Arkham Asylum who later went insane himself and had to be admitted to his own institution. It's just a creepy vibe as you listen to chilling recounts of horrible crimes. It gives Arkham Asylum a history you piece together throughout the game. The game's atmosphere is one of its more acclaimed elements, even after the later Arkham games outshined this one in mechanics. Arkham Asylum is usually not a scenic location in most Batman continuities, but the artists did a really good job giving the place an unsettling vibe now that you explore it to this level of detail. The whole place just looks really gross. The floors and walls are grimy, and the facilities are organized like maximum security prisons, which they have become because of how many costume supervillains need to be here giving Arkham this oppressive feeling to it. It just feels like a place where nobody would ever come out of it better than they were before, not one iota rehabilitated. Not like you need to feel bad for the likes of the Scarecrow or whoever, but Arkham still does treat regular people, as evidenced by the medical building playing these taped recordings on loop. One of them is this advertisement that's a guide for parents on how they can send difficult kids to Arkham Asylum. A place that is quite literally hell on earth just by looking at it. Our website contains everything you need to know about our facility and how we can help you. Did you know that the children's area on the site can provide you with a detailed but discreet psychiatric profile of your problem offspring? When you walk into intensive treatment at the very beginning of the game, you're hit with this foreboding music. Music is one of the ways they sell the atmosphere throughout the campaign. I already established the dreary feeling to the opening, but then when Joker escapes, the music is chaotic. But that doesn't last long. Joker was planning this takeover for a while, and thus it doesn't take long for him to actually do it. The music on the island getting more intense as goons pick off the Arkham security staff. By the end of the game, there isn't much music at all when exploring the island. Joker is just fully taken over, and it's up to Batman to stop it as the odds continue to rise against you. But that's part of what makes Batman so cool. Here you have a game where every set piece is the most ludicrously undoable challenge, and yet Batman is completely unfazed by it. I mean, there are only so many characters who can be told by Killer Croc that he's gonna rip you limb from limb and yet go into his lair with this attitude. Croc's just an animal, and animals just need traps and the right fate. I'll be fine. The narrative in this game is pretty compelling, too. The basic outline of the plot was simplistic at the start of the video, and by the end, I'd still say this is a simple story, but as I said before, less is more. Joker has returned to Arkham intentionally because one of the leading doctors, Penelope Young, was developing a drug called Titan, which is even more powerful than Bane's Venom formula. Joker was secretly funding Dr. Young's research using an alias because he wants to use the Titan formula to create an army of monsters to rule over Gotham City. She tried to give him his money back and end the project, but now he's come back to Arkham to collect on his monsters. I don't feel like Joker creating an army of monsters feels much like his usual MO, at least in the incarnations I've watched, but I think it's compelling in and of itself, as the game reveals more information at a good pace that keeps you invested in what's going on. You get introduced to Dr. Young as another hostage to save, but later learn why she's so important to Joker as Oracle details the emails sent between Dr. Young and Joker halfway through the story. And you listen to Joker's interview tapes to find out how they got to this point with the alias and all that. What helps this game feel really authentic as a Batman fan is its voice cast. The game brought Kevin Conroy, Mark Hamill, and Arlene Sorkin back from the DCAU to play Batman, Joker, and Harley Quinn, respectively. The rest of the cast are all new actors for those characters, but having those three back was really important. Paul Dini, writer of several iconic BTAS episodes wrote the story of the game too, which made the whole thing feel like a reunion of the animated series. It's noticeable that 17 years had passed since they all first started playing these characters in 1992, but I actually like how the actors sound in their more seasoned appearances over the early episodes of the show. I think that comes down to my own nostalgia lining up with the later appearances, but still, I just enjoy the dynamic as everyone is really comfortable in the roles and slips right back into it. Tell me something. You've never let me catch you this easily. What are you really after? Oh, nothing much. Hundreds dying in pain and fear. All their meaningless lives brought to a horrifying conclusion. All thanks to you and a book of matches. 
Was that the answer you wanted? Of course, this discussion would not be complete without a mention of the tragic passing of Kevin Conroy last year. It came as a real shock to me, because I don't think I even knew he was diagnosed with cancer at all until the news was dominated by his passing away. Both in the recording studio and in life, he really was the definitive Batman. Just a great human being who was a joy to be around for everyone who knew him. I never met him personally, but the impact his portrayal of Batman has had in entertainment is profound, having voiced the character more times than any other actor in history. He really loved it and the fans, and respected it, and that was evident throughout his whole career. Mark Hamill deciding to retire from voicing the Joker after Kevin Conroy passed away was an act I really respected, too. His impact in this character will also be felt for a long time. Definitely being my favorite voice of Joker and consistently being entertaining as a scary villain and as a funny one. In Arkham Asylum, he had like a thousand lines to read as Joker's constantly talking over the loudspeaker, but we wouldn't have it any other way. He's got a lot of great lines in this game. Can you smell the excitement in the air? No? Hmm. Must have been one of the guards, then. Having a little trouble up there? Joker. You're expecting maybe two faith. Hey, that's go easy on him. For me. Oh hell, what do I get? Do me a word! <laughs> But the voice acting is only part of bringing the story to life. The cutscenes were all done with motion capture like pretty much every game with human characters. The scenes themselves are directed really well from the camera movements and all that, but I was just impressed with how the motion actor did a good job moving like Batman. I think the in-game animations and the cutscene actor both do a really good job embodying how Batman walks around with a commanding stature. Sounds small, but the little things like that are really important in creating a game where the player feels like Batman. Credit is due to how the cutscenes that are pre-rendered switch to real-time graphics instantly instantaneously, no seconds long cut to black or anything. But age has not been kind to the cutscenes otherwise. I've seen my fair share of pre-rendered cutscenes, and this might be some of the crustiest I've ever laid eyes upon. Look at the scene where Bane first shows up. It's like you can count the pixels on the smoke individually. I thought my playing on PC at 4K might have made the cutscenes look worse, but on console it looked exactly as bad, even when I was playing at 720p. Not much you can do about that though, the cutscenes are what they are because they were pre-rendered, but since I just mentioned the PC port, I'd like to take a moment to talk more about it. The game first released on PS3, 360, and PC, and I chose to play it on PC for the video because it's clearly the best version of the game. Technically, the most complete edition of Arkham Asylum is the PS3 version because that one came with exclusive challenge maps where you play as the Joker. He's really funny to play as in combat as he's deadly with his strikes, but all those strikes are meant to look silly. But the stealth maps aren't great because Joker doesn't have much in terms of mobility or gadgets, but it is something only PS3 players will get. If you have a PC, there's really no reason to play the game on console ever again because that's how you get 60 FPS when on console was capped at 30 and didn't even look like it was hitting that most of the time. The PS3 and Xbox 360 have not aged that well if you ask me, because miserable performance was the norm. Though on PC I did have some issues, like how I have two monitors and this is one of those games that just locks your mouse onto the monitor the game is on. It's just an annoyance, as you have to alt tab to get out of the game. I also had to play in 4K and not screw up the resolution of my monitor. But with that higher res came the smallest subtitles I have ever seen in my life. Oddly, the rest of the HUD and UI scale to 4K just fine, but the subtitles are borderline subatomic. I kept switching them on and off early in the game because I wasn't sure if I wanted the viewers of this video to have to look at it, but I'm somebody who uses subtitles whenever I can, so I just said screw it and went with it. But to my knowledge, there's no fix for that either. But I think those are all tiny issues in the grand scheme of things. The PC version is still the greatest of them all for that silky smooth frame rate. But I guess that sentiment is kind of analogous to the whole game. It's got some issues, but I feel like as many people as possible should play it because it's aged pretty damn well. The game isn't even that long. My playthrough took me about 7 hours, and then also another hour after the credits trying to collect everything I missed during the campaign. It's the right length and it's very replayable, first via the challenge mode maps I talked about earlier, but also thanks to the campaign is being fun to blitz through multiple times. I sucked at this game when I first played it as a kid. I somehow didn't realize there was a counter button until I got destroyed by this enemy encounter at the start of the Arkham Mansion. But as I kept replaying it, I found all those tiny ways to go faster. I'm by no means a speedrunner of any game, really, but like I said, Asylum had all these little moments where I felt like a gaming god for skipping content. Like when I realized you didn't have to see this interaction with Harley at the door of the medical building if you just went through the roof instead of the door, or how this stealth encounter in the medical building can be skipped just by walking into the elevator. Big time saves? Probably not, but still I have a lot of memories of this game like that. The game keeps the pace up throughout with interesting new set pieces and enemies popping up relatively frequently despite the shorter runtime. Every player of this game is going to remember Killer Croc's lair, for example. 
Batman has to go in there to collect some spore samples, and the player has to move really slowly for fear of Croc popping out and chasing you. Playing it now, it's pretty scripted a lot of the time, and not that scary, but the first time, I think this might have been the most tense part of any game I had played up to that point, because it felt like it would jump out at any moment if I didn't move at the speed of molasses. The subject of scary things in this game no doubt makes you think of the Scarecrow, though, who also appears three times in the game with his signature fear toxin. This forces you into these nightmare scenes you have to navigate through. Nothing too out of the ordinary for Batman or for gaming gimmick levels as the stealth is your basic hide and move when the light is out of the way kind of thing, but the third one deserves a special mention because the game decides to put the player on fear gas for a second by pretending to fucking crash. and then boot up the opening cutscene. What could possibly be scarier than the threat of losing progress? I've waited a long time for this, Bats. Let's start the party with a bat. <laughs> What can I say, I like this game. It's hard to forget with moments like that crammed in as often as possible. Though I do keep mentioning this game has flaws and I've gone into some of the ones I have, mostly due to the first game syndrome and combat and all that. But the biggest issue with this game is that despite how iconic Batman's villains are and how well written they are in the game, the boss fights are atrocious in this. Within the first 30 minutes, you have to fight a Titan monster prototype, which seems like a mini boss as its pattern is just charging at you and then you have to hit it with a Batarang and then it's stunned. But then that's almost every boss in the game, including Bane. You just fight Titan monsters, or just regular enemies of the bigger one in the background like the Poison Ivy fight. They clearly did not have any idea on how to translate the Arkham gameplay to a boss fight when designing Asylum, and thus you have to fight the same mini-boss reskinned like eight times. None worse than the final boss. People have talked about how horrible this final boss is for ages, and I've always agreed, but then replaying it after years just leaves you shocked at how terrible it is. Joker decides to hit himself with the Titan formula, turning him into a Bane-like monster, which feels really out there even for Joker. But you don't even fight him, you just hit the same goons again and again, and then pull Joker off a ledge three times, and that's the final boss. But calling it a boss fight might actually do the name a disservice. But it doesn't really leave a bad taste in your mouth, because the ending is still pretty cool to see. Ready for the next round? Always. What? I'll never let you win. <laughs> never. Once Arkham is back under control, Batman takes off, hearing that Two-Face is robbing the second national bank. Not a moment's rest for the Dark Knight. A great way to end, because what might be the worst night of any other protagonist's life is not going to put a stop on Batman, ending Arkham Asylum. As I said, the really terrible final boss does not detract from the game overall. Whenever you finish this game, you just think, man, that was really good. And what more do you need? It's an all-time great, which got the reception it deserved. People wanted a great Batman game, and Batman deserved a truly fantastic, top-quality title, and that's what the world was given. There were obvious spots that needed fine-tuning, but Arkham Asylum was clearly the kind of game that stood on its own two feet. A game that would have been an influential game had it been a standalone because it was fantastic. And that's the way I think it changed the industry. Good superhero games existed before, but Arkham Asylum was the first game to really have it all, from top-class production values and storytelling to addicting gameplay that carved out its own category of the action genre and is just really damn good. I personally believe this is the first superhero game that transcended just being really good and achieved all-time great status, raising the collective bar in these superhero games in the years to come. Now its sequel, Arkham City, is one I've always thought of when asked about my favorite games of all time, so I'm very excited to revisit that game and see how much I enjoy it now, which you'll see the results of next week. But until that time comes, I'll say what I always do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.